The first church we come to is the church at Ephesus. To appreciate and understand Ephesus, all you have to do is understand New York. Ephesus was the New York of Asia Minor, now known as Turkey. Ephesus was the center of commerce, of culture, of civic uh, focus, of fashion. If you wanted to go on vacation, Ephesus was the place to go. It was a tourist city. It was well known throughout Asia as the place to go. It was like a Wall Street. It, it, it dealt in significant financial matters because of its strategic location. It was also known for idolatry. The church at Ephesus, where you get the book of Ephesians out of. That's the book written to the church at Ephesus. The story of the church's beginning Feel free to read it sometime. It's Acts chapter 19 of how in the midst of sorcery and witchcraft and economics, people got saved and the church was established. And it is expressed to us in Acts 19 about the energy, excitement, and challenges that face this brand new church. But here in the book of Revelation, he is not writing because all is well. He is writing because of a situation that needed to be addressed for people who wanted to be overcomers, as I hope that we do. He makes it clear in the first verse that this was written for the angel of that house, that is God's messenger, the word angel from the Greek word angelos means messenger, that the messenger, the pastor, if you will, was to proclaim this message to the congregation at Ephesus Bible Fellowship. And if you and I will hear what he has to say, he that hath an ear, let him hear, verse 7 says, then you are on your way to being an overcomer, an overruler of that which is ruling over you. Now he first wants you to know, according to verse 1, that the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands, says this. So before he says anything, he wants to let you know where he's walking. He says he's walking among the seven lampstands. That's the seven churches. So right now, as we gather in our congregational meeting today, there is an unseen visitor. Jesus Christ is walking up and down the aisles of this worship service. You cannot see him because he's here in spirit, not in body. But he's very much there and he says, He that walks among the seven lampstands says this. And the first phrase he says is, I know. So he wants you to know as he passes by your pew, I know you and I know you. I am well aware of what your ministry has to offer. You are a serving church. You're not only a serving church, but I also know verse two says, your toil. The Greek word for toil means to labor to the point of exhaustion. I see you sweating. I see your overtime. I see you huffing and puffing to get the ministry done. So you don't only do stuff, you go overboard in the doing of stuff. Your toil, you, you are tireless in ministry activity, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware of that. You're not only a serving church, you are then a sacrificing church. You go overboard. In addition to that, I know, he says, verse 2, your perseverance. I know that you don't quit when the going gets tough because you are a steadfast church. When, when times are hard, you keep going. You don't throw in the towel just because you may not be feeling it today. I'm well aware of your longevity. I'm conscious of your 40 years. Not only that, 
I am also well aware that you do not tolerate evil men and you test them who call themselves apostles and are not. You are a separated church. That is, you are orthodox in theology and doctrine. You test things to see whether they are consistent or inconsistent with the Bible. You are a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing, Bible-quoting, Bible-toting church. You're serving, you're sacrificing, you're steadfast, you're separated, you're suffering. You are uh, a model congregation, and I know it. But the commendation now turns to a criticism or a condemnation. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Wait a minute. Jesus, you just told me five things that you like about me, about Ephesus Bible Fellowship. Jesus says, I've seen, I've seen your commendable attributes, but I have this one thing against you you have left your first love so evidently you can be a serving church and a serving Christian and have left your first love evidently you can be a sacrificing church and a sacrificing Christian and have left your first love you can be a steadfast church and a steadfast Christian and have left your first love you can be a separated church and a separated Christian and have left your first love. You can be a suffering church and a suffering Christian and still have left your first love. So evidently, you can be doing right stuff and be in wrong relationship. To love God is to passionately pursue God's pleasure. To love God is to passionately pursue God's pleasure. But here's the problem, because I am sure there were believers in Ephesus who says, I, I, I love the Lord. Oh, but that's not his complaint that they don't love him. His complaint is they don't love him first. You have left your first love. Now, you may still love me, but you no longer love me first. Let me explain something about God that um, we all need to grab. We need to get this one. There are certain things God can't do. So let's get this straight. We got this thing, God can do anything. Well, not quite. Certain things he just can't do. God can't lie, the Bible says. By two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. So he can't lie. God can't sin. Uh, God can't act contrary to his nature, for then he would no longer be immutable, the unchanging God. God cannot stop existing because he's eternal. So he can't do that. There are some things he cannot do. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. He cannot be second. Whenever God is made second to anything, even if they are good things, it's unacceptable. Because he is in a class by himself. In the beginning, God. Before there was anything, there was God. The Bible says over and over again, what's the first commandment? You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. What does it say about Jesus Christ that he might have first place in everything? Paul says in 1 Timothy, when you come before God, first of all, raise holy hands, men, before the Lord. Do it first. When it comes to giving, God says, give to the Lord the first fruits of what he's given you. All through the Bible, this thing of first, 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 first. Because God assumed 
choose. If he's not first, he must not be worthy. God demands to be first in our affection, in our attention, in our priority. He demands to be first because that's what he is. And when he is no longer first and has been repositioned with something or someone in place of him, you've just created an idol because you've made something else first. And whatever is first becomes your God. So now God has competition in your life. He's not saying you don't love me. He's saying you don't love me first. That I am not your priority and I don't know how to be second. We, individually and corporately, have often committed the sin of making ministry for him more important than relationship with him and the cost has been great in our spiritual experience of him. He says you've left your first love. You've compromised religion for relationship. And you've left me. And you know the bad part about it? We've left him and don't even know we've gone. What does it look like when you leave your first love? It means that you have to find time for him when you have time for other things. The reason why we have to find time for God is because we don't want that time. So we got to fit it in when nothing else is competing with it. That's because he's not first love. He's when I get around to your love. When I get around to you, I'll spend some time in prayer. When I get around to you, I'll spend some time in your word just meditating on you. When I get around to it, I'll spend some time just giving thanks for what you've already done and not just asking you for what I want you to do. I'm going to do it because you are first. And that mean, may mean I have to get up a little earlier for you to be first with my day. So what do we do about this? And why will it matter? Verse 5 tells you what to do. Three things. He says, remember from where you have fallen. The three R's. The first one he says, I want you to remember. Remember. Remember how it was, O Cliff, when you didn't have all these buildings and all these programs and all these members and Remember back there when you were just in a house and you had to depend on me for everything. You, you go back to that time when you didn't have to manage all this and have all this and all you had was me. You, you remember that. You remember saying, when you first got saved, you didn't know anything but John 3.16 and you just knew one little hymn, you couldn't, you couldn't wave your hand in the air like you just don't care. You didn't have all of that. All you knew was your sins were forgiven. You were on your way to heaven because you had come to Jesus Christ. You didn't have much. You, you, all you had was me. You better remember. Remember where you came from. Because you ain't always been up here. You haven't always been on Camp Wisdom. You haven't always been doing this. You weren't always blessed like you are now. He says, remember. Remember when I'm the one that mattered most. Second hour, he says, repent. Okay, there's only one thing you repent of in the Bible, and that's sin. It's the only thing you ever call to repent of, and that's sin. So guess what? Leaving your first love is sin. It's not just a bad habit. It's not just a mistake. When the relationship becomes secondary to the program, you're living in sin. I'm living in sin. 
we collectively are living in sin when the relationship is secondary to the program. He's not just calling it, oh, my, I got to get my priorities together. No, you got to get your sin fixed. Because he says, repent. You only repent of sin. So he doesn't review this just as a scheduling issue. He views it as a sin issue. That I am no longer the priority in your life. You have programmed me to be second. And all the programs are wonderful. He says you must repent. You must turn. You must turn. John 14, 21. It's a powerful verse. He says, if you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And to the one who loves me, watch this, I will disclose myself to him. Whoa. I will talk to him. I will show him or her. I will reveal myself. The reason why we're not hearing from God, the reason why we're not getting guidance from God, the reason why we're not experiencing victory from God is because he doesn't feel free to disclose himself to somebody who's going to treat him second. He drives it home now. He says, now, I do have to compliment you because, verse 6, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were professing Christians who were abusing grace. They thought grace was an excuse to sin. Because I have grace, I can just go do anything. He says, I know you hate that, so I, I want to commend you. I want to commend you. But this first love thing, watch this. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Pay attention now. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So I'm talking to the churches, but are you listening as an individual? He that hath an ear. She that hath an ear. So forget your neighbor right now. The question is, what are your ears picking up? He that hath an ear. So now it's an individual question, but being delivered to the whole congregation. Do you have an ear to hear? Well, everybody in here has ears, but you can have ears and not hear. He wants to know, are you paying attention to what is being said here about the primacy and prioritization of God in your life? And if you have an ear that is willing to hear and to reprioritize relationship over religion, devotion over duty, he says, if you have an ear, this is what happens to him who overcomes. To the one who overcomes. Overcomes what? Overcomes the pressure to...
first. Because it's pressure sometimes to put God first. You got to go against your inclinations. You got to go against other people. You have to go against your schedule. You have to go against, your, there's pressure not to put him first. So you got to overcome that pressure. He says, if I am not going to be first, verse 5 says, I will remove your lampstand out of its place. You'll go to church, but I won't be there. No love, no light. You'll run your life, but I won't be hanging with you because I'm not going to hang with a believer who doesn't value me enough. Who else died for you? Who else paid for your sins? Who else has given you eternal destiny? Who else, has, who else do you call on when life shuts down on you? Well, if you think that they're your savior, go to them. Go to them. But if you really want me to be all out in a bag of chips, I need to be first. And to him who overcomes the pressure not to put me first. To that one, to he, because he says he who overcomes. I'm going to reward her. He who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I will grant the overcomer, not every Christian, because he's only talking to Christians here. So every Christian doesn't overcome even though they are an overcomer. To he who overcomes that which Christ has already overcome for them, I will grant him to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. He's speaking about a future reward that will come. But that future reward receives a down payment in this life. It's not all experienced here now because we live in a sinful world. What is this eating of the tree of life in the paradise of God that I can begin to experience some of it now and much of it later? He will disclose himself beginning now. John 14, 21 says, to you and me. Now, if you've left your first love, the keys are still in the spot you left it. They have moved. So he's waiting on you to meet with him. Every day, every day, he's waiting for me. And, and I, I know what it is to, to lose that. One year, many years ago, we went on a family vacation to Niagara Falls. Drove up from Dallas to Niagara Falls. We got there at night. And Niagara Falls has an American side and a Canadian side. We went to the Canadian side. We went into the hotel at night. I pulled back the curtain and I could see the falls in the distance. And I went, wow. They had lights on the falls. And, and even though I was a long way away in the hotel room, I was just awed by the sight, even from a long distance. I just went, whoa. The next morning we got up and had breakfast and we went to the Canadian side of the falls. And on the Canadian side of the falls, there's a park. So we stood in the park. Oh, this was different than the hotel room. Hotel room, I couldn't hear a thing. I could just see it. But now I'm standing on the Canadian side and that water is going over the precipice and going into the basin of the falls and I could hear the thunder of the roar as the water splashed down in the falls and as the wind blew up the water, it actually crossed the street and I got dots of water on my face from the fall. You see, when I was in the hotel room, I could just see it and be impressed by it. But once I got a little closer to the park, I got affected by it because I could hear the sound and I got little drops of water on me. So I felt a little something, something because I had relocated myself. Oh, but there's another way you can see the falls. It's called the Maid of the Mist. These are little, little boats down in the basin of the fall. If you decide to get on the Maid of the Mist, they're going to give you a raincoat and they're going to give you an umbrella because you're about to be drenched by the falls because you are so close. See, some Christians are satisfied to see Jesus from their hotel room. 
They look out. They never hear from him. They never get to see him up close. They just impressed from a distance. And every now and then they look his way. But then there are a few Christians who will come to the park and they like the sound and they will be a little closer. And every now and then they'll feel a little something, something. But then there are those few Christians who are not satisfied to look at him from the hotel room. They're not satisfied to look at him from the park. They want a raincoat on. They want an umbrella over them because they want to be drenched by his glory. May God raise up saints who leave the hotel room not satisfied with the park, but want to be drenched with his glory and overwhelmed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Did you know that some things God can't do? Oh yeah, some things God can't do. I know that may sound a little crazy, but think about it. The Bible says God cannot sin. Can't do that. The Bible says by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. He can't do that. The Bible speaks about the fact that God exists in simplicity because he's spirit. So he can't be divided. Can't do that. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. He cannot be number two. Whenever you put God in second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place, or no place, then what you ask him to be a part of is something he cannot do. That's why there's so much in the Bible about idolatry, because you've, you've put some, something or someone next to him. He can't do that. And when you understand that God...
but can't be second and therefore won't be second, that changes how you relate to him and how you prioritize him. Did you know there's some things God can't do? And one of them is he can't be number two. You and I must learn what it means to have God in first place. And you can be doing a lot of good things and he still not be first. Because he wants to be first relationally more than anything else. And when you prioritize making him first in the relationship, you have set in motion how the rest of your life can be operated in an orderly fashion. God is so good at what he does, he can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other and put it in his cosmic blender. Dr. Tony Evans says God works all aspects of our lives for our ultimate benefit. That's the good news about the sovereignty of God. He can even use evil to accomplish his goals. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. If God made everything, did He also make evil? It's a question people have been asking for centuries, but Dr. Evans says it's one that has a biblical answer. Today, he looks at how God uses both the good and bad events in our lives. Let's join him. The second most important truth you can learn about God is his sovereignty. The second most important thing you can learn about God is his sovereignty. The first thing that you should learn is the gospel. The good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how faith in his finished work gives you, guarantees you eternal life. But when it comes to now living your day-to-day -day life after having become a Christian, the most important thing for you to understand is God's sovereignty. To the best of my ability, I want to, based on his word, help us to understand and relate to this critical dimension of God that is in fact critical for every aspect of your life. Now, this is not a popular truth that we're going over today because men want God everywhere but on his throne. We live in a day when men want a jack-in-the-box God. When the grandkids come over the house, we've got this little thing you we grew up with where you turn it and you play the music and at the proper time, pop up comes the clown. And when the entertainment is over, he's pushed back in the box until the desire to be entertained again and it's whirled around until it pops up again. What people today want is a God that will pop up conveniently when we want him or need him. And then when we're finished with him, he's put back in the box until such time as he's called upon to bless us, to forgive us, to help us, to encourage us. Oh, it's not that we don't want God, that we just want him conveniently. But to understand this doctrine, this understanding of God will blow your mind. 
And if you understand it enough by the time we are finished and respond to it accordingly, it can also change your life. So what do we mean by the sovereignty of God? The sovereignty of God refers to God as absolute ruler, controller, and sustainer of all of his creation. To talk about sovereignty is to talk about rule or authority. And he sits on the throne of the universe. Everything he created, he rules over. And he created everything. What this means is that there is no now person, place, thing, or thought that situates itself or operates outside of God's sovereignty. That there is nothing that escapes him, nothing that can override him, nothing that he is not fully aware of because he rules all things because he either causes all things to happen, one option, or he consciously allows things to happen. But there are no oops, mistakes, miss that one, or surprises. Because if it happened, he either made it happen or he okayed it happening even if he didn't directly cause it to happen. So let's get this straight. Nothing exists outside of the rule of God in your life, in this world, or in creation. The Bible says not one bird falls to the ground of which he is not fully aware and not one hair of one's head is lost, that he is not fully overseeing that. So he is not just sovereign in the sweet by and by, he's sovereign in the nasty here and now. He's sovereign in the big things and he's sovereign in the details. He is absolute ruler over all things. Job chapter 23 verse 13 says, God does what his soul desires. Job chapter 42 verse 2 says, no purpose of God can be thwarted or overridden. He will achieve his goals. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, God is in the heavens and he does whatsoever he pleases. Psalm 135 verse 6 says, God rules from the heaven and that even includes the fish in the sea. Nothing sits outside of sovereignty. God will always accomplish his purpose. What you do or do not do will never block God from getting to where he's designed to go, okay? He will go with you, around you, or over you, but you will never interfere with his end result. God will always accomplish his purposes because God never limits himself to one route, This church is 11 miles from downtown Dallas. There is a preferred route to go to downtown Dallas, a direct line, 35 North. You get on 35 North, it will take you directly to downtown Dallas. That is the preferred route. That is the quickest route. But sometimes 35 North gets blocked with an accident, gets blocked with construction, and the route is no longer the convenient way to go. Well, because of Google Maps and other technology, you're not limited to 35. They will show you other options. If you know it, there are more than one options than your preferred route. God would prefer to accomplish his plan with your cooperation. That's what he would prefer. Because if he can accomplish it with your cooperation, everybody wins. But if you don't cooperate, don't think you were his only option. He's got multiple ways of accomplishing his goal. 
He can do it with you or without you. He can go around you or run over you. But no human being will thwart God's ultimate plan. You are his preferred route. Never his only route. And so when you understand that God's sovereignty does not negate your choice, it includes freedom to choose. You are free to choose. God didn't stop Adam and he's not going to stop you. He'll give you indicators, but, but he will let you choose because he made you with that, within certain limitations and boundaries. But you need to know when you choose against him, you have opened up the door for the manifestation of another attribute. Because God exists for his glory and the glory is the manifestation of his characteristics, perfections, or attributes. God is so good at what he does. He is so good at what he does, he even uses evil to accomplish his goals. So even when folk are evil, he says, I can do something with that. Isn't this what Joseph said in Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring me to this place. Guess how God got me here? God got me here by you boys getting jealous. God got me here by you selling me into slavery. God got me here by you accusing me of rape. God got me here by forgetting me in jail. God got me here from Pharaoh having a bad dream. And God didn't use all that mess to bring me to this place. And see, that's the good news about the sovereignty of God. He can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other and put it in his cosmic blender. By itself, it may not look like much. You take the flour by itself, it ain't much. You take the sugar by itself, it ain't much. You take the the different ingredients of a cake by themselves, it's not much. But bake it right. And all those independent elements are joined together to accomplish something. That's why Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who love God and are the called according to his purpose. He says, I prefer 35. Cooperate with me. He's so good at what he does as sovereign, he even uses the devil to help him out. That's as bad as you can get. That's as low as you can go. Because the devil is not the devil. The devil is his devil. (laughs) Peter, Luke 22. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has made a request. Why? Because even the devil can't do anything without asking God first. And we're going to let him mess with you a little bit to to put you in your place. But when you have been converted, when your life gets right, when you stop trying to do this stuff on your own, when you learn your lesson, then I can use you. But I'm going to let the devil mess with you a little bit because you you ain't thinking right. You ain't acting right. You're not living right. So I'm going to let him blow you up until you get right. Then I can fix your life. The only reason Job's life fell apart was because the devil made a request of God and God okayed it. And the great apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said there was a messenger sent from Satan to buffet me, to oppress me. And I went to God and I said, God, get the devil off my back. You ever said that to God? Get the devil off my back. He said, God, get the devil off my back. And God said, no. No, I'm going to let him ride you. Because I got to deal with something in your life that's a problem. And I need the devil to amplify it so that you see it, so that I can deal with it, so that you can get rid of it, so that I can do something special with you in a greater revelation. God is sovereign and he rules within boundary he allows choices and according to Lamentations chapter 3 verse 37 and 38 he rules both the good and the evil Dr. Evans will come back to explain what that means for us when he continues our lesson in just a moment 
But first, I want to tell you about Prayers for Knowing God. It's Tony's latest book, and it's designed to help you develop a healthy and ongoing communication with God, leading you to experience greater grace and peace. And if you visit TonyEvans.org today and make a contribution, we'll send you the Prayers for Knowing God book, as well as all 12 full-length lessons from Tony's current teaching series, God's Heart Revealed. These two resources are designed to help you appreciate God's motives, desires, and will for your life, leading you to move closer to Him. And today's the last day you can get them bundled together as our way of saying thanks for your support of Tony's ministry. Get all the details and make your request online at TonyEvans.org or call us at 1-800-800-3222. I'll repeat that information for you after part two of today's message and this. Throughout any woman's life, you'll hold many roles, and so often it can feel like you're just plotting to get through. We know that this can feel like obscurity and mundane tasks, but whatever God has called you to do, plant yourself there because you got a harvest coming back to you if you do. Carrying the legacy of Lois Evans, daughters Crystal Hurst and Priscilla Shire encourage you to not just survive the season you're in, but thrive there with the new four DVD Bible study, Seasons of a Woman's Life. With your generous gift to The Urban Alternative, receive the classic book, workbook, and DVD series now. He rules both the good and the evil. Okay, now you understand sovereignty. You got a little handle on it. What does this mean? The first thing it means is that you change your vocabulary. First thing it means is you change your vocabulary and you X out the word luck. You cannot have sovereignty and luck. I know how we use it casually. We use it for everything. We got lucky dog. We got wish me luck. We got plain luck. We got luck be a lady. We got lady luck. We got tough luck, good luck, blind luck, bad luck, rotten luck, and then pot luck. We got luck for everything. You cannot have sovereignty and chance. You cannot have sovereignty and fate. You cannot have sovereignty and happenstance. You cannot have sovereignty and accidents. Because nothing sits out of sovereignty. So now when you get that straight, it changes your prayer life. When Paul says pray without ceasing, the reason why he can say pray without ceasing because now you've included God in everything. He's not included in everything because if he's in control of all the details, then The little things, the medium things, the big things are all God. So I'm talking to him all the time about everything. Sometimes formally, sometimes informally, sometimes walking, sometimes thinking, sometimes driving. I'm bringing him into everything. Why? Because he's sovereign over everything. Don't affect your prayer life. Now, now God is engaged everywhere. You are now looking for him everywhere. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 reads this way. Paul the apostle says, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. He says two powerful things. He says, God the Father, we exist for him. God the Son, Jesus Christ, we exist through him. So we exist for God and that is made possible through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So when you accept Christ, you now can exist for God. And you are now operating or designed to operate under his rule. And when you decide, when I decide, because we all have failed in that decision on various levels, but when we decide to align our lives under his sovereign rule, that's when you get to see how real he is in your life. Many of the problems that we are facing in our lives, with our strongholds, in our relationships, in our our careers, with our finances, are due to the fact that God is not allowed to rule in certain areas. We'll let him rule over here, but you better not touch over there. When we exist for him, that is the only reason you exist. You just get bonuses along the way. 
God is sovereign. So I close with with a passage that says it all. I can't improve on this one. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to read it and comment along the way because it says it all. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar. I'll call him Nebi for short. Verse 28 of Daniel 4. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected. So he's walking on the roof and he's just thinking. He reflected and now we're told what he thought. He reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built? As a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. So he's walking on the roof smelling himself says, is this not the great Babylon that I have built? You the man. You all that in a bag of chips. You, you, you look at what you done done, boy. While the word was in the king's mouth, while he was still talking to himself, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. What you just said, I just canceled. And you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven periods of time, seven years, will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over all the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from heaven until the hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claw. He went insane. Verse 34. But at the end of that period, seven years, completion of time, Nebuchadnezzar raised his eyes toward heaven. And my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. What did you say, Nebuchadnezzar? For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand. And at that time, my reason returned to me. And my majesty and splendor was restored for me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out so I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me now I Nebuchadnezzar praise, exalt honor the king of heaven for all his works are true and his ways are just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Okay, pay attention. Whenever God sees you infringing on his sovereignty, he gonna make a lesson out of you. Whenever he sees you think you all that, he gonna show you at whatever level is needed, there is one God and you are not he. What he's going to do is drop the mic on you. And he's going to let you see that he is the sovereign. He's in charge. And you are not to compete with him. If you ever hear Tony Evans say, look at the great oak cliff that I have built. If you ever hear me say, look at the great 
enterprises and the people and companies and organizations and resources that I have built. You better grab me quick because the hammer is getting ready to drop on me. To God be the glory, great things he has done. He is to get the credit. He is to get the glory. Dr. Tony Evans, wrapping up his 12-part series on God's Heart Revealed. And that means today's the last day to take advantage of that special offer I mentioned earlier. You can get all these messages in their entirety on both CD and digital download, as well as Tony's brand new book, Prayers for Knowing God, as our way of saying thanks when you make a donation to help support Tony's ministry. Just contact us anytime today at 1-800-800-3222 to make the arrangements. Resource team members are standing by to assist you 24-7. That's 1-800-800-3222. Or make your request online at TonyEvans.org. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. When life gets thorny, many times our only instinct is to do whatever it takes to get things back to normal. But tomorrow... Dr. Evans will explain that God just might have something bigger in mind. Be sure to join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. something invisible and spiritual. The consequences we are dealing with in our lives, in our homes, in our culture, we are dealing with them because there is a gap between where God is and where we are. He wants to know that you want Him and not just want His stuff. See, a lot of folk go to church to get God's stuff, but who don't want the God who gives it. So if you're in distress, don't let that drive you away, draw you near. When you get close and want to live for him, want to please him, want to honor him, want to exalt him, want to draw near to him, then heaven opens up and he lets you find him. He lets you find him. Kingdom authority may be defined as the divinely delegated right and responsibility for believers to act on God's behalf in spiritually ruling over his creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Kingdom authority is the divinely delegated right and responsibility that has been bequeathed to believers to act on God's behalf to rule over his creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. With God's kingdom comes authority. One of the ways that that authority is grasped, connected with, and utilized is in kingdom prayer. Kingdom prayer is divinely authorized access for heaven to invade earth for heavenly intervention into historical circumstances. And one of the expressions that talks about authority is binding and loosing. Now, if you've grown up in church, you've heard people talk about binding this and binding that. And what they're talking about is exercising authority. And that is precisely what the phrase means. But I want to take you deeper into the meaning of the phrase, the utilization and understanding of how to apply the phrase so that you and I get the benefit of the phrase and start binding and loosing like we're supposed to. 
The word binding and loosing is not a magic formula for you to get God to do what you want. Yet it is a powerful formula because of what's stated. Because verse 18 says, whatever you bind, and it goes on to say, and whatever you loose. First of all, whatever. <laughs> this scope of this statement is staggering. In other words, he doesn't give an exception. He says, whatever you bind, whatever you loose, it says heaven is going to back it up or to put it in contemporary words, God says, I got you. I got you. Please notice something in the phrase. You are the one doing the binding, not God. You are the one doing the loosing, not God. Whatever you bind and whatever you loose will have been done in heaven. So God will back up legitimate binding and legitimate loosing to bind means to restrict, to bind means to lock, to bind means to restrain, to bind means to tie down, to bind means to hold something so that it cannot do what it wants to do. You are limiting its ability to function because you've tied it up, you've bound it, you've wrapped it up, you've put a knot on it, you've held it back. Conversely, loosing is to unlock or to release. It is to permit. It is to free something up. The first thing that leads up to his statement in chapter 16 about binding and loosing is the statement is specifically given to and given about the church. I will build my church. He comes with binding and loosing after that statement. Why? Because binding and loosing is a specific authority given to the church. It's very important. Binding and loosing, the exercise of authority, is specifically given to the church. I will build my church. Now, the reason why that's important is you need to remember something about the church that we often lose sight of and some don't even know. Why you come to church for preaching and for singing and for fellowship and all of those are very important things. There is another purpose of the church that's absolutely critical and that is legislating from the spiritual realm. The job of the church is to legislate from up there to down here, to bring heaven in the history. That is the job of the church. It is to spiritually legislate, not just sing, not just preach, but to bring the authority from eternity in the history. So it is, the church represents another realm, although it's located on earth. It represents heaven, but it's located in history. And it has been given homeland authority to operate in history from eternity. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is many Christians don't understand this. If you are disconnected from the church, you are disconnected from its legal authority in the spiritual realm. He says, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. He says, so powerful is the church I'm building that hell can't stop it. He didn't say shall not overpower me, he said shall not overpower it because he's referring to the church that is legislating from heaven. So when you see hell defeating the church, it's because we're not building Jesus' church, we're building our church using Jesus' name. He says, the church that I am building that legislates from history, Greek word, ecclesia, church, 
was a legal term for legislation, legislating in the spiritual to bring it into history. He says, the gates of hell, gates is a legal term. In the Old Testament, it says, the elders met at the gate. That's like saying city council meeting, city hall, Congress, parliament. It was the place where legislation was made at the gates. So it's a legal term because hell does not defeat you with power. Hell defeats you with legality. Hell operates on a legislature, okay? It operates legally. And if you do not understand that, it's not just power operating, it's power operating from an illegal position, but yet from a legal posture. So he says, the gates of hell shall not overpower it. Now he's talking about the church. Then he goes further. Now we come to, come to verse 19. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, kingdom is God's rule. And I'm gonna give you keys. He says, I'm going to give you access to me to legislate from there back down to where you live. And I'm gonna give you these keys. Now, the reason why there are multiple keys is because there are multiple gates. Well, now we come to the end of verse 19. Whatsoever you bound on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been already loosed in heaven. I got you. So what exactly are we binding and loosing? Well, let me tell you, based on this passage, you're binding and loosing what's coming out of hell, gates of hell. You're binding and loosing. So what's the difference between binding and loosing? Bind, when, you, when you've been binding something, you're tying it up. You're keeping it from mobility. You're keeping it from moving. To bind means something is coming after you that you want held back from you. You want it to be tied up. You don't want it to get through. You don't want it to, to be able to penetrate you. It's holding evil, Satan, hell off of you. Loosing is because he already got you. He's already all up in your grill. He's already controlling something. You're already addicted. You're already living in defeat. You're already relationally in discord. You're already miserable and you can't get out of it and you need to be loosed from the hostage taking. He's already taken you. Binding is keeping him off you or anything that is influenced by him because the hell influences everything. It influences debt. It influences bad relationships. It influences addictions. It influences uh, hell. Hell can influence any area of your life. To bind it means to keep it from having a illegitimate dominant influence. To loose means it's already having an illegitimate dominant influence. I'm already in debt over my head and can't get out. I'm already in a bad situation relationship. I'm already addicted to something or the other. And I'm already held hostage and nothing is working, but I need to be loosed. I studied the Bible in college for four years. I studied the Bible for four years working on my master's degree, another four years working on my doctoral degree. And then I've been preaching all of these years and I'm still learning new things from this awesome, inexhaustible book, The Word of God. And that's why I'm so excited about the Tony Evans Study Bible and its accompanying work, the Tony Evans Bible Commentary. It will take all of this training and this teaching and make it available to you to understand, utilize, and apply God's most powerful word. I need to be set free from it. He says to be, to bind, to keep it off you because it's coming at you, or to loose because it's already got you and you want to get rid of it. He says, you must do it. Whatever you bind, I got you. Whatever you loose, I got you. Heaven will back you up. 
Well, if the problem is the gates of hell, he says, you must use the keys of heaven and you must do it in concert with the church because that's the entity that owns the keys. So you don't have a private key ring. You, you don't have your own keys. The church has the keys. You have to use those keys for your situation. So now that we have that framework, let's go back to chapter 18. He starts off again in, in verse 18 and he begins this process by talking about binding and loosing. But now he goes further and he's going to explain how to get this thing working for you. So I'm assuming somebody in here needs to bind something or loose something. Again, I say to you, verse 19, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Oh, now we get down to two or three. Interesting. Two or three witnesses is not a novel concept. It's all through the Bible. American civil government, to a large degree, borrowed from the Bible, and one of the things they borrowed was the principle of witnesses. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says, you cannot accuse somebody by the witness of one person. There must be two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse six, you cannot bring an accusation or judgment by one person. There must be two or three witnesses. So two or three witnesses was used of uh, confirming something legally because it's used of trying civil cases. Jesus takes the principle of legality, two and three witnesses, and applies it now to binding and loosing. Why? Because we are seeking to do in the spiritual realm what the political realm was seeking to do in civil judgments. To do that, he says you need two or three witnesses. Now, this is not just two or three people out of nowhere because in verse 17, he says, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So he hasn't left the church. He's still talking about the church because that is the authorized legal entity from heaven to history. So let me explain something. When you connect with people, even if they're Christians, who are not connected to the embassy, they can't help you with binding and loosing. Because binding and loosing has only been delegated to the church, not just to you out here just binding stuff and I bind the devil and you know, you know, no, no, no. If you are disconnected from the embassy, that's why people don't just need to go to church for preaching. People don't need to go to church just for singing. He says two or three gathered. Okay, the word gathered is used of the church in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Don't forsake the gathering. It's, it's talking about the church. He says when they are connected and two or three, now we got legal validity because that's how the word two or three is used in scripture. We've got legal authorization. So let's see how you can begin to bind and loose. Keep, keep the devil off of you in whatever category he's on you or get him off of you if he's already locked you down and loose him and get, get, get him off of your back. No longer is he controlling whatever area of your life that he happens to be controlling right now. He says, if you come together, two or three, that's a legal gathering because it's connected to the church, anything, somebody say anything. That's like whatever. Okay, verse 18 says whatever, verse 19 says anything. Anything that they may ask. Oh, we just introduced prayer, ask. So now you are asking, you're asking heaven to intervene on your behalf in history for the binding and loosing as defined in chapter 16, which is the gates of hell. He says, ask anything 
that they may ask, please notice something. The two must agree. Forget spiritual authority where there is disunity. So he says it must be by agreement. That is, you've got to be in the same, you're different people, but you've got to be on the same spiritual page. Okay? So he says that. And then he makes a staggering promise. It shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So you must bind, you must bring God's perspective, the keys, you must talk to God, the prayer, you must be in agreement with God, and then you must be linked to the legal entity, the local church. And he says, and you've done it in my name. In my name. He says, the Father's going to do it, but you got to do it in my name. Now, Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Translation, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge up there in heaven and I'm in charge down here on earth and I'm the link between the two. So in order to get it from heaven down here to earth, Jesus is saying, you got to come through me. There's one mediator between God and man and the Bible says that is the man, Christ Jesus. He will only give his authority when you're operating on his authority based on his keys connected with his institution done by agreement. And he says that you must do it in my name, but he says something else. And there am I in the midst. Whoa. See, a lot of us pray in Jesus' name while he is on the periphery. He cannot be on the periphery. He must be in the, he must be the centerpiece of the decision. You want to know God's philosophy of history? It's Ephesians 1.10. Because Ephesians 1.10 says God has circulated all of history around the centrality of Jesus Christ. So, binding and loosing, getting the devil from tying you up or releasing you if you've been tied up, is tied to authority. Authority is tied to Christ. Christ is tied to his church. Binding and loosing is tied to that connectivity by agreement. And then there is the provision of divine authority where the Father responds when we do it in his name. See, a lot of us use Jesus' name and we'll even quote Jesus' word but without authorization because we're not subjected to Jesus's will or subjected to Jesus's authority or subjected to Jesus's okay. And so it becomes an unauthorized use. And when it is an unauthorized use, you can't bind and loose, which means you can't have authority. Okay. But you must do the binding and loosing. God's not going to do it for you. He's going to say, I got you when you're operating as he said. So the question now is, why the two or three in this context? Let me use a biblical illustration that, to try to make sense of this. In Exodus chapter 17, beginning around verse 8, Israel is in a battle. They're in a war. They're fighting. It's a life and death struggle. They're battling. Moses goes up to the top of the hill. And Moses takes the rod, the staff that God gave him. They turned it into the rod of God. And Moses held it up. The rod was Moses' symbol of authority. He opened the Red Sea with the rod. It was a symbol of heaven coming down to change something on earth when he held up the rod. As long as Moses held up the rod, it says, Israel prevailed. But the moment Moses dropped the rod, it says the enemy prevailed. Oh, wait a minute now. Israel down in the valley, doing the best they can, fighting as hard as they can, trying as hard as they can. But whether they were winning or losing wasn't determined by how hard they were trying. It was determined by what Moses was doing, upholding up, the symbol of authority. 
A lot of us are trying hard to fix our mess. Get out of debt, get out of addiction, solve this problem, heal this mess. It's not we trying, we're trying down here in this battle, but the problem is something's gotta be solved up there to give you victory down here. The problem occurred, however, that it says Moses' arms got heavy. In other words, he got tired. Let me put it another way, he got sick and tired. He got tired, his arms got heavy, and his arms started to droop. And when his arms started to droop, it says the enemy began to prevail because the symbol of authority had been lost. So Moses got two other men to come and to hold up his arms because he was tired and he was going to droop and quit and give up. But the two men held up his arms. They became two witnesses. And when they held up his arms, it says, and Israel prevailed over their enemies. Let me put it another way. What was happening on the ground would not ultimately be determined by what they were doing on the ground. Now they still had to fight on the ground, but the power and the authority for the victory of the fight was not on the ground where they were fighting. The authority and victory and power would come from what was happening in the invisible realm that would determine whether they won or lost in the visible realm. If you're fighting for your marriage, if you're fighting for successful singlehood, if you're fighting for the debt, if you're fighting for the addiction, or whatever the situation happens to be, yes, you have a responsibility to do what you ought to do, but that's not where the authority lies. Whatever you buy, whatever you lose, it says, I will have already done it in heaven. So the answer is up there. So to put it another way, if you ignore the spiritual, if you ignore the keys, if you ignore the connection with the church, if you ignore the agreement, if you ignore those things, you will not get help from heaven while you're battling the warfare on earth. You will only get victory on earth because you have engaged the authority of heaven God's way. And when you and I do that, now we'll see some binding. And 